Coming in at number 10, we have Corey Monteith's substance struggles. According to Frederick Robertson, during the early Glee days, Corey Monteith was really concerned about maintaining a clean image. When he got the role, he knew he was supposed to be a good kid. And he didn't want his past getting out. With Glee being the beginning of his success, he didn't want the world to know that he was struggling with alcohol and substances. While his struggles may have been kept a secret to the public, Corey had no problem with disclosing them to his close friends and roommate, Justin Neal. In 2008, Corey would admit to Justin about his substance use in the past and that he was trying to stay sober as it was a big part of his life. According to the docuseries, Corey started skipping school to do substances at the age of 13 and he went on to attend a dozen schools, including programs for troubled teens and often stole large sums of cash from his family. At the age of 19, his mother and friends staged an intervention, leading him to enter into a rehab program in 2001. It wasn't until Glee's second season that he went public with his struggles, admitting in an interview that he wanted to share his past so people didn't assume he was exactly like his all star character, Finn Hudson, by saying, I feel like I had to step in at some point and relate to people with my experience and where I come from. Corey's publicist, Leslie Diana, also said he wanted to go public to help others as Corey wanted to show them that you could come out on the other side and do well in life. Number nine, Corey and Leah's relationship. Lee stars Leah Michelle and Corey Monteith didn't go public with their relationship until 2012, but according to Garrett Greer, an assistant to the executive producer on seasons one and two, they first got together years earlier in 2009. He would go on to say they had been an item before the show premiered, and during season one, or part of it anyway, Leah and Corey were involved, and then later the relationship came back full force. Later, Garrett would go on to describe Leah as a narcissist, and then would go on to note that the other members on the Glee set also didn't think they were a good match. Even the set decorator, Barbara Munch, would make a comment about the relationship when she said, it seemed odd because it was about her always, and I think he just accepted that. Doug Kirkpatrick, head of hair department in season three, would also go on to say that Corey and Leah's relationship also had a negative side effect on Corey's mental state. And he said, a lot of Corey's confusion had a lot to do with his relationship with Leah Michelle. I don't know if she was a friend. I think she was involved with him because he was on a TV show. Patrick Chinzel, a key assistant location member, would also ask the ultimate question if that Leah was good for Corey, and then he would go on to say, I hope so, I would think so. I know other people who say maybe. That wasn't necessarily true. It seems like people didn't really understand why Corey was dating Leah, and many felt like she wasn't good enough for him. Hey my little peaches, are you liking this video so far? If so, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Coming in at number eight, we have Naya Rivera and Leah Michelle's hated each other. If you were a fan of Glee, or you watched just one episode, then you would know it's no secret that Naya, who played cheerleader Santana, and Leah, who played the dorky Glee girl no one liked, Michelle, were at odds most of the time, but you may not know they were at odds in real life as well. Naya herself, who passed away in an accident while she was boning in 2020, wrote about the friction in her 2016 memoir, Sorry Not Sorry, and would write, one of the Glee writers said that Leah and I were like two sides of the same battery, and that about sums us up. We are both strong-willed and competitive, not with each other, but everyone. And that's not a good mixture. In the documentary, Naya's father, George, spoke of the pair's rivalry and he would say there was always a fight between them. Always. Everybody knew. Everybody saw it. They hated each other, but at the same time respected each other's talent. George would also note that Naya even complained about Leah to production and it would cause Naya to be briefly let go from the cast. Number seven, Naya Rivera's dad's warning. Naya Rivera's dad, George, recalled the last time he spoke to his daughter, which happened to be via FaceTime shortly before she passed away. George would go on to say, I get a sinking feeling because we've been boating forever. I was on FaceTime with her, trying to talk her through the pitfalls. First of all, I said, Naya, you're on a platoon boat. That's not a boat. Why are you on a platoon boat? I said, do not jump off that effing boat. If you got an anchor, you can anchor it, but do you know how to anchor it? We went through a couple of interactions like that, and then the FaceTime call hung up, and that was the last time I talked to her. After he received a call from authorities about his daughter, George would begin a multi-day drive from Knoxville, Tennessee to Ventura County, California, but even though he considered his daughter was a really good swimmer, he instinctively 
feared the worst by saying, I knew immediately when I got the phone call in Knoxville that it was over. You don't find a drifting five year old child asleep on the boat at the end of the lake without his mother and have any hope. I had no hope. And speaking about his grief, he would also say, You don't process it. I don't know what everyone else does, but for me, it's as fresh today as it was two years ago. He would also later add that Naya knew she was on a really good show with lots of tragedies and that he didn't know if you could equate that to fame, but he thought it had something to do with it. Number six, fame. Corey Monteith's former roommate, Neil, said that Corey struggled with fame as Glee's popularity skyrocketed and the show's fandom intensified by saying, There was a period where it seemed Corey was getting more and more isolated. He just got to the point where he just hated fame. He said, I'm just so tired, I want to rest a bit, I'm sick of singing these songs, and I remember him specifically saying, I wouldn't wish fame on my worst enemy. Neil then continued to say, I'd seen the fame, but I didn't realize how hard it was until then. Then, I think with that level of fame, you lose sight of who you are to every single person. He wasn't Corey anymore, he was now Finn. We just knew he wasn't in the best place. Neil would also add in the second episode, in the documentary The Price of Glee, that Corey became frustrated with Glee's demanding schedule and wanted more freedom with his career as he had to turn down movies and he was becoming more erotic and isolated. However, Neil did know as much as he didn't like fame, he knew how lucky he was and never took that for granted. Number five, the Competitive cast. The cast members in Glee were all relatively unknown before they appeared on the show. And as they began to become a household name, their social media pages also started to take off. As Glee increased popularity, so did its stars. When the cast members' social media began to rise, they were all poised to dominate emerging platforms, but their competition wasn't always friendly, according to the docuseries commentators. Doug Kirkpatrick, who was head of the hair department in season three, would note that he would often see the actors gathered talking about how many people they acquired as followers and that it quickly became a competition. He would also say, in the beginning, they had to tweet every day and it was Leah who really had the numbers. Journalist Andy Swift would also note that the actors started competing on their social media pages and they almost began to fight about it immediately. So it must have hurt a lot knowing that even in real life they would be in superior to Leah Michelle. Number four, peer pressure. One of the most controversial allegations in the documentary hinted that Corey Monteith was sober before his passing, but that a co-star encouraged him to drink and it went downhill from there. In the documentary, hair department head Doug Kirkpatrick recalled one of the final times he saw Corey in the troubling story the actor allegedly told him. Doug would say he wasn't drinking, he didn't have any substances in his system, and then the very last couple of days I saw him, he was different. He was under the influence of alcohol, he said he was at a party, he hadn't been drinking, he wanted to have a drink but knew he shouldn't, and he was told by a certain cast member that same night, you know, if you want to have a drink, you should have a drink. I'll be here for you. You can always trust that I'll be here for you. Doug also would go on to add his opinion by saying, in my opinion, you wouldn't never say that to someone who is sober and so that confused him and kind of made him mad and he started drinking because he was given permission by somebody. While Doug did refuse to mention any names, he would choose to keep the alleged Glee member a secret because he wasn't there when it happened and he didn't hear the Glee member say it in person himself. However, Doug would add that Corey resented it but also took the direction and that he believes this is the moment that sent him on the path to self destruction. Mark Salling was largely unknown before he landed the role as Noah Puck Puckerman, who was Finn's best friend and like Corey, he was a bit older than the rest of the cast. At the time, it has been said that both Mark and Corey were 26 when Glee premiered. But according to Munch, Salling's age wasn't the only thing that made him stand out among his co-stars. Munch would say he was quieter, for sure, and kept to himself because I think he felt more of an adult than the others. Just was, you know, a bit off and he wasn't just a regular young man. He had some issues going on, it seemed obvious. Then a few months after, after Glee ended its sixth season run in 2015, Salling was arrested for possession of illegal photos and videos that contained younger people on them, a charge he ultimately pleaded guilty as part of a plea deal. He then took his own life on January 30th, 2018, shortly before he was scheduled to be sentenced. Even Glee director of photography Christopher Baffa from seasons 1 to 3 would say Salling's offset behavior didn't jive the person he experienced, but he acknowledged that actors are typically on their best behavior once they get around the crew. How did he get there? He was a great guy. What happened? I don't know. Number 2. 
forced return. While creator Ryan Murphy now believes Glee should have ended after Corey's passing, at the time he largely left the decision up to Leah Michelle. With various options on the table, including a six month hiatus or cancelling the show altogether, Leah chose to return to work just two weeks after her boyfriend and co star's passing. Back in 2013, Leah would tell Ellen, I said, we have to go back to work. We have to. They're my family. However, many of the cast members interviewed in the docuseries were not supportive of this call. Jody Tanka said, It was only a couple of weeks. All of the actors had just pulled themselves together to get back to work. Everyone was kind of forced to. J.A. Byerly, a rigging gaffer on seasons 1 to 5, said Fox was conscious that Glee was about to cross the 100 episode mark. The traditional threshold for ultra profitable. They wanted a product, so we spit out a project. They were looking for 100 episodes. In October 2013, Glee paid tribute to Corey in The Quarterback, the third episode of season 5, and the episode follows the members of the Glee Club as they cope with their grief in the wake of Finn's passing. Honoring his memory with emotional performances of songs from season, from season of Love. Love, if I Die Young, and Make You Feel My Love. Glee ultimately went on for two more seasons after Corey's passing, but Briarly says he was never far from the cast and crew's minds, and you could always feel an emptiness because Corey wasn't around anymore. And coming in at number one today, we have the Glee Curse. Over the past few years, there's been much talk about the Glee Curse, but the cast seemed to reject this theory. Kyle Birch would say, I remember someone mentioning the Glee Curse to one of the cast members, and they got pretty upset about it because they were like, no, this show is not cursed. Cursed. There is no Glee curse. Derek Greer would add that bad things happen, it's life, and unfortunately with Glee, there was more tragedy than any other show, but not everything can be full with sunshine and rainbows. Christopher Baffa would also add that ultimately, those close to Glee want the show to be remembered for spreading inclusivity and positivity, not tragedy. He would also say, I don't think Glee is ever going to outlive the tragedies of some of the cast tensions or some of the things that were said about it, but I'd hate to have those aspects as real as they are, take away from the good that was achieved because I do believe that good was achieved. Number 10, Jamie Lynn Spears. Zoe 101 was a boarding school set dramedy that hit Nickelodeon in January of 2005. Starring as protagonist Zoe Brooks, Jamie Lynn Spears was reportedly brought on by its creator Dan Schneider because she looked a lot like her older sister and superstar Britney Spears. But little did fans know there was actually a scandal brewing behind the set as its star was just 16 when she fell pregnant, which would have been a bombshell for the very PG show. In her memoir, Things I Should Have Said, Jamie Lynn Spears confessed that her team decided that Britney Spears should not be told about her pregnancy as it was too risky. Quote, the entire Spears team was already caught up in my sister's PR difficulties and everyone around me just wanted to make this issue disappear. From there, her family and management pulled her out of school until they could figure out what to do next and even took away her phone for fear that she would tell the world about the news. As a result, the actress said that her father even stopped speaking to her. But when the news got out, Nick immediately released a statement saying, we respect Jamie Lynn's decision to take responsibility in this sensitive and personal situation. And after wrapping shooting for the fourth season of Zoe 101, the network went on to cancel the series. Number 9, Anne Walker Farrell. A director on Netflix's Bojack Horseman, Anne Walker Farrell wrote on Twitter that she was preyed upon by Nickelodeon showrunner Chris Savino 15 years ago when she was 20, when they both worked at the Cartoon Network. She wrote that she was speaking up for the young guns out there there and also posted what appears to be a letter advising the unknown recipient that Savino should be terminated from Nickelodeon for being a predator and a liability. Anne's complaint was shared publicly and actually ended up working, as once the truth was exposed it became a massive PR nightmare for the network, akin to their own version of Harvey Weinstein. The scandal became too much for the company to bear, and in 2017 Nick was forced to fire Savino over the allegations made by Anne and at least a dozen other women. It was a tough decision for them considering the fact that he was one of their most prominent showrunners who has been in the business since the early 90s. Number 8, Mark Summers. You might remember Mark Summers as the host of the Nick game show Double Dare, but the face of one of Nickelodeon's biggest 90s hits apparently doesn't think much of the channel, and he has made his opinion pretty clear in a 2013 interview. 
quote, the network is going in the dumper. Disney beats it. They have no idea what they're doing. They put on a bunch of cartoons and stuffed animals instead of real human beings that other people can associate with. The creative people are gone. It's become a how much money can we make from this merchandise and how many tours can we put out and steal money from the parents. Nickelodeon obviously did him dirty when you think about everything that he said, but his bitter rant was far from over and in that same interview, when asked if he would ever return to the network, he grew frustrated and called the executives of Nick a bunch of a-holes who have been trying to screw him over ever since he left. It's entirely possible that his time at the network did not end well and they decided to blacklist him and get some kind of revenge for him leaving on bad terms. But maybe it wasn't all that simple considering that in 2018 he returned to the Double Dare stage as the announcer for the revival of the show. Number 7 Josh Peck The star of Drake and Josh actually read Jeanette McCurdy's new memoir and shared some incredibly kind words about the actress, saying, I think she's incredibly brave to tell her story and to be as honest as she is. Just like Jeanette, Josh released his very own candid memoir this year called Happy People Are Annoying. In it he opens up about the hurdles he faced as a former child star including his weight struggles and year-long battle with substance misuse and addictions. Looking to feel better about himself, the actor explained in an interview that he lost 127 pounds in an 18 month time span while filming the show. But when that didn't bring him happiness, he admitted that he turned to alcohol and illicit substances for help. In the tell all book, Josh disclosed his earnings on the show and revealed that he averaged roughly $15,000 per episode. But after paying a 20% fee to his agent, along with other fees to different managers, he wasn't left with very much at all. He also explained that he hasn't made any money off the show since it ended in 2007, despite the fact that reruns continue to play to this day, simply because kids TV doesn't have residuals. Number 6 Jeanette McCurdy The iCarly star recently released a book titled I'm Glad My Mom Died, which shocked fans to the core upon its release, because it reveals what really went on behind the cameras at Nick. Jeanette exposed her traumatic experiences as a child star and detailed numerous instances where she felt exploited as an actor both on and off set. Describing the creator as mean spirited, controlling and terrifying, she alleged that Dan Schneider was extremely inappropriate with the cast and at one point he was not even allowed to be on set with them and had to direct the episodes from a separate control room. She also opens up about the perils of young fame and reveals that she developed an eating disorder, partly due to pressure imposed on her by her mother. And if you had any remaining doubts about how serious her allegations are, Jeanette also revealed that the network offered her $300,000 if she agreed to keep silent about her experiences. The 31 year old said that the offer was made right after her stint in Sam and Cat ended in 2014, and at the time she said that it felt like hush money. In the end, after everything she had gone through as a child star, she rejected Nick's offer and has been vocal about her experiences ever since. Number 5 Avan Joggio The Canadian actor had his breakthrough role playing Beck Oliver in Victorious, but after Jeanette McCurdy's bombshell allegations surfaced, fans really started to question whether or not he had the same experience. In a recent TikTok video, Avan admitted that he did not actually remember filming the series at all because he was blackout drunk almost every night. Quote, when you don't remember a single plotline to a single Victorious episode, but you do remember going out partying every night. When one fan added that the show seems like a fever dream to her, Avan said, me too, and I was there. And when another fan asked, so Beck was hungover all the time, he said yes. This admission was a huge red flag because in Jeanette's new memoir, she talks about the creator pressuring her to drink while she's underage and telling her that the Victoria's get drunk together all the time. The iCarly kids are so wholesome. We need to give you guys a little edge. Sometime later, she claims that Schneider got in trouble with Nickelodeon for inappropriate behavior with the young cast and was not allowed to be near the actors anymore. So it's entirely possible that he was creeping on more than just one actor at the same time. Number 4 Katina Waters In 2014, the stuntwoman from iCarly claimed that the production ruined her career by recklessly dropping her from far too high above the ground. 
causing some really horrific injuries. In a stunt gone wrong, Katina Waters was supposed to be dropped slowly from the ceiling for an episode of iCarly in 2011. She was to be slowly lowered to the ground while still attached to a wire. Instead, she claims that the person operating the descender machine dropped her without warning and she crashed to the floor. The consequences of the incident were extremely gruesome as the fall caused severe injuries to her leg, including fractured bones and torn ligaments. But the long term effects on her health were even worse for her career. Waters was a highly successful stunt actor who performed in dozens of TV shows and movies, but of course she missed out on a lot of work following the incident. Subsequently, she decided to sue the producer Schneider's Bakery plus Nickelodeon and MTV networks for the pain, suffering and loss of earnings as a result of the incident. While the lawsuit was a really bad look for Nick, it shined a light on the mistreatment of the cast and crew on some of their biggest shows. Number 3. Caitlin Sanchez The network had a really big mess on their hands when Caitlin Sanchez, the teenager who played Dora the Explorer for over 3 years, alleged that when she made the deal with Nickelodeon to voice the iconic character, she was given just 22 minutes to sign the contract without an experienced lawyer. The young star allegedly did so under duress and with the promise that she'd receive residuals for her work, plus money from merchandising, which was not true at all. Dora the Explorer is now an $11 billion global brand, so the contract that Caitlyn signed actually conned her out of millions of dollars. In 2010, she decided to sue Nickelodeon and MTV networks, specifically citing unpaid working hours as well as being paid only $40 for promotional appearances. The legal battle made headlines throughout the world and thanks to statements made by Caitlyn's attorney that if Nickelodeon refused to pay up by a certain date, he'd expose their humiliating secrets. Although she was somewhat successful in the end and received a settlement of $500,000, she later tried to resue because she and her family alleged that their attorney at the time acted fraudulently and neglected to tell them about taxes and lawyer fees. But by now, many people realize that the network has a problematic history of underpaying their child stars. Number 2. Angelique Bates The actress who was one of the original cast members on Nick's hit sketch comedy show All That that exposed the reality behind the cameras when she spoke to the Shade Room in 2016. Angelique explained some of the horrors she endured such as physical, emotional and mental mistreatment from her mother in front of producers who not only turned the other cheek but strongly urged her to just accept the violence and remain silent. She said that she was only 12 years old when the nightmare began and that producers and cast members could hear her yelling but nothing was done to help her. According to Angelique, Child Protective Services did eventually show up in 19 96, but she said the adults on set pressured her to stay silent. Angelique's mother, Dee Bates, came forward in support of her daughter, although she tried to shift the blame onto the network. Whatever the case with her mother's questionable side of the story, the former child star also explained that she was pretty much released from her contract at age 15 and claimed that she was blackballed by the entertainment industry as a result. But to this day, Nickelodeon has never come forward with an official response to the accusations. Number 1. Alexa Nicholas The former Zoe 101 star has recently come forward with her own Nickelodeon horror story while protesting outside of Nick's Burbank headquarters. According to TMZ, the 30 year old actress organized the heated protest herself in order to bring more of her own disturbing allegations to light, specifically against iCarly series creator Dan Schneider. In recent years, Alexa has been active in her advocacy for survivors of violence as she leads her own organization called Eat Predators. While standing at the studio's front doors, she alleged that during her time on the show, she and fellow child actors were not safe, so she organized the protest at the studio to speak up and try to change things by taking matters into her own hands. Alexa revealed that she didn't feel Nickelodeon had her best interest in mind and called her entire experience there traumatic. She believes in exposing the truth about the network's business practices and calls out Nick's excessive use of NDAs which she says silence children and prevent them from getting help. She even brought up the fact that Nick has yet to respond to the allegations from Jeanette or herself or announce that they plan to take any kind of action at all. Number 10. iCarly Stunt Double If you want to know something that proves the people at Nickelodeon only care about money, I've got a scandal for you that was almost swept under the rug entirely. In 2014, a stunt woman from iCarly claimed that the production ruined her career by recklessly dropping her from far too high above the ground, causing some really gruesome injuries. In a stunt gone wrong, Katina Waters was supposed to be dropped slowly down from the ceiling for an episode of iCarly in 2011. She was supposed to be slowly lowered to the ground while still attached to a wire. Instead, she claims that the person operating 
using the descender machine dropped her without warning and she crashed to the floor. The medical consequences of the incident were pretty horrific. It caused severe injuries to her leg, including fractured bones and torn ligaments. But the long term effects on her health were even worse for her career. Waters was a highly successful stunt actor who performed in dozens of TV shows and movies, but of course, she missed out on a lot of work following the incident. Subsequently, she decided to sue the producer, Schneider's Bakery, plus Nickelodeon and MTV networks for pain, suffering, and loss of earnings. And she made the right decision as it later emerged that it wasn't the first time something like that had happened on the show. Number 9 The Gack After seeing countless celebrities being slammed on TV for years, there was an extremely high demand for Nickelodeon to release their iconic gooey green sludge to the public. This led the network to release what they called Gack into toy stores across the country in 1992, much to the delight of 90s kids everywhere. The product wasn't exactly slime that they had on the Nick shows, it was more like a squishy putty that made funny noises when you pressed it between your hands. Kids also loved the name Gack because not only was it onomatopoeia, but it also just sounded like how the product felt. However, the branding turned out to be a highly controversial decision, as the name itself was common street lingo for illicit street substances. In fact, it was literally a term for the substance that goes onto a spoon. The story goes that while someone on the Nick crew was working with the then nameless slime one day, they nicknamed it Gak, which became a naughty inside joke on set because of its meaning. Game show host Mark Summers was in on the joke too and eventually started saying it live on air, but Nickelodeon's marketing department allegedly had no idea and just cluelessly went along with it. Number 8 The Voice of Dora The network had a really big mess on their hands when Caitlin Sanchez, the teenager who starred on Dora the Explorer until she reached puberty, alleged that when she made the deal with Nickelodeon to voice the iconic character, she was given just 22 minutes to sign the contract without an experienced lawyer. The young star did so under duress, with the alleged promise that she'd receive residuals for her work, plus money from merchandising. This was in 2007, years before Dora the Explorer was established as an $11 billion global brand. So in 2010, Caitlin sued Nickelodeon and MTV networks for making her sign what she believed was a terrible contract that conned her out of millions, specifically citing unpaid work hours as well as being paid only $40 for promotional appearances. The legal battle made headlines throughout the world thanks to statements made by Caitlyn's attorney that if Nickelodeon refuses to pay up by a certain date, he would expose their humiliating secrets. But the young voice actor ended up settling for $500,000, but then tried to resue because she and her family thought that the lawyer acted fraudulently and didn't tell her that most of the settlement would be eaten by taxes and lawyer fees. But to fans, the whole settlement just proved that the network certainly had something to hide. Number 7 Chris Savino Once it was exposed, the massive scandal that was a PR nightmare for Nickelodeon was akin to the network's own version of Harvey Weinstein. In 2017, Nick was forced to fire one of its most prominent showrunners, Chris Savino, over allegations made by at least a dozen women. Savino, who has been in the business since the early 90s, previously worked on such animated shows as Dexter's Laboratory and The Powerpuff Girls, and was the creator of Nick's second highest rated kids show at the time, Loud House, which centers on a boy's life while dealing with a house full of sisters. According to Cartoon Brew, as many as 12 women came forward to accuse Savino of predatory behavior, including unwanted sexual advances and threats of blacklisting after the relationships with co-workers had ended. What's even more disturbing is that the site said that the reports date back at least a decade. One woman said that she didn't accept an offer to work at Nickelodeon simply because Savino worked there. She alleged that when they both worked for Disney, he sent her explicit text messages and photos and once offered her a job in exchange for inappropriate things. And Walker Farrell, the director of BoJack Horseman, also came forward with her own Savino horror story from the early 2000s, when both of them worked at Cartoon Network. Just goes to show you how cases involving power and inappropriate behavior infect almost every corner of Hollywood. Number 6 Zoe 101 The show was a boarding school set dramedy that hit Nickelodeon in January of 2005. Starring as protagonist Zoe Brooks, Jamie Lynn Spears was reportedly brought on by its creator Dan Schneider, all because she looked a lot like her older sister and superstar Britney Spears. But little did fans know there was actually a scandal brewing behind the set, as its star was just 16 when she fell pregnant, which would have been a bombshell for the very PG show. In her memoir, Things I Should Have Said, Jamie Lynn Spears confessed that her team decided that her pop star sister 
should not be told about her pregnancy because it was too risky. Quote, the entire Spears team was already caught up in my sister's PR difficulties and everyone around me just wanted to make this issue disappear. From there, her family and management pulled her out of school until they could figure out what to do next and even took away her phone for fear that the news would get out. As a result, the actress said that even her father stopped talking to her. But once the news was released, Nickelodeon immediately released a statement saying, we respect Jamie Lynn's decision to take responsibility in a sensitive and personal situation. And after wrapping shooting for the fourth season of Zoe 101, the network cancelled the series altogether. Number 5. Jason Biggs In the early seasons of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles on Nickelodeon, Jason Biggs could be heard voicing lead turtle Leonardo, but scandal quickly erupted at the network when it was revealed that his social media activity was offensive enough that there were many calls to Nickelodeon to protest his involvement with the show. So in 2014, after only two seasons, he was ultimately replaced by Seth Green on the popular series. And for a good reason. Jason's Twitter in the 2010s was a PR nightmare. In fact, there didn't seem to be any topic too controversial for him to joke about, like a bachelorette contestant who died, a plane crash, the Pope, women's basketball, and sexually explicit comments about the politician Paul Ryan's wife. But the jokes backfired big time when the official Ninja Turtles Twitter account gave a shout out to Jason's personal account and encouraged their followers to check it out. It's safe to say that the kid-friendly and PG Network is not pleased with the immense backlash that they started receiving from parenting groups and conservative bloggers, eventually leading them to release a statement apologizing, while Fox News host Megyn Kelly called the American Pie actor a disgusting pig and called for him to be fired. Ultimately, the network responded to the pressure and gave Jason the boot. Number 4. Angelique Bates The actress who was one of the original cast members on Nick's sketch comedy show All That exposed the reality behind the cameras when she spoke to The Shade Room in 2016. Angelique explains some of the horrors she endured such as physical, emotional and mental mistreatment from her mother in front of producers who not only turned the other cheek but strongly urged her to just accept the violence and remain silent. She said that she was only 12 years old when the nightmare began and that the producers and cast members could hear her yelling but nothing was done to help her. According to Angelique, Child Protective Services did eventually show up in 1996 but she said that the adults on set pressured her to stay silent. Possibly in an attempt to muddy the waters or save her own skin, Angelique's mother Dee Bates came forward in support of her daughter, although she tried to shift the blame onto the network. Whatever the case with her mother's questionable side of the story, the former child star also explained that she was pretty much released from her contract at age 15 and claimed that she was blackballed by the entertainment industry as a result. But to this day, Nickelodeon have never come forward with an official response to the accusations. Number 3. Victorious Canadian actor Avon Jogia had his breakthrough role playing Beck Oliver in Victorious, but after Jeanette McCurdy's bombshell allegations regarding Dan Schneider, fans really started to question whether or not he had the same experience. In a recent TikTok video, Avan admitted that he did not actually remember filming the series at all because he was blackout drunk almost every night. Quote, when you don't remember a single plotline to a single Victorious episode, but you do remember going out partying every night. When one fan added that the show seemed like a fever dream to her, Avan just said, me too, and I was there. And when another fan asked, so Beck was hungover all the time, he just said yes. This admission was significant because in Jeanette's new memoir, she talks about the creator pressuring her to drink while she was underage, allegedly saying, quote, The victorious kids get drunk all the time. The iCarly kids are so wholesome. We need to give you guys a little edge. Sometime later, she claims that Schneider got into trouble with Nickelodeon for inappropriate behavior with the young cast and was not allowed to be near the actors anymore, meaning that he had to direct them from a separate control room. So it's entirely possible that he was creeping on more than just one actor. Number two, Jeanette McCurdy. The iCarly star recently released her new memoir which has been described as both heartbreaking and hilarious. The blunt title, I'm glad my mom died, shocked fans upon its release because it reveals what really went on behind the cameras, something that up until now fans have only been able to really speculate about. Jeanette exposed her traumatic experiences on Nick and the disturbing truth about how she was mistreated by her mother who pushed her to be a child star, noting that her own persona that she was known for throughout her youth and her young adult life was all the front 
forced upon her by her mom, who in addition to everything else was extremely physically inappropriate with her. Jeanette also discusses the perils of young fame and reveals that she developed an eating disorder as a child and talks about why she ultimately quit acting altogether. She also goes into great detail of numerous instances where she felt exploited as an actor both on and off set, describing the creator as mean spirited, controlling and terrifying. The former Nick star recalled a time when she was filming an episode of iCarly that he insisted that she wear a bikini instead of a one piece swimsuit which she was much more comfortable with. Number 1 Drake and Josh This show was one of the most popular shows on Nickelodeon in the early 2000s. Starring Drake Bell and Josh Peck, the sitcom was one of the network's most successful projects from that time. So when the truth finally came out, fans were understandably left disillusioned and upset. Nobody knew that behind the scenes, Josh heavily struggled with addiction. Looking to feel better about himself, the actor explained in an interview that he lost 127 pounds in an 18 month time span while filming the show. But when that didn't bring him happiness, he admitted that he turned to alcohol and illicit substances for help. But that was nothing compared to the revelation that his co-star was caught grooming young fans. In July of 2021, Drake Bell pled guilty to attempted endangering of children and disseminating harmful materials to juveniles after a young woman came forward and accused him of predatory behavior. The 19 year old who chose to remain anonymous claimed that he began talking to her when she was 12. The actor managed to get away with two years on probation and 200 hours of community service. But at 36 years old, Drake Bell's reputation is now irreparably tarnished. And at number 10, we have Hillary Duff. Even though Hilary Duff was on another list in this series, I wanted to bring her back for another reason. Hilary Duff and Disney announced last year that they would be coming out with a reboot of the beloved teen show, Lizzie McGuire. But the series' original showrunner, Terry Minsky, decided to leave the reboot shortly after because of creative differences. After this, Hilary posted to her story that another Disney show, Love, Simon, would be moving from Disney to Hulu because of adult themes. With Hillary writing over it, quote, feels familiar, which made everyone think that was happening to the Lizzie reboot. Hillary ended up confirming that theory shortly after in a post where she said she hoped the series could move to Hulu as the show was going to be about 30 year old Lizzie and it couldn't be made under PG restrictions. But sadly, Disney said no to the move and the reboot was cancelled. With Hillary saying on Instagram, quote, I want any reboot of Lizzie to be honest and authentic to who Lizzie would be today. It's what the character deserves. Continuing to insinuate that the show was cancelled because it was too mature. In at number 9, Love, Simon. This Disney Plus show was pitched and in the works until it was cancelled by Disney for not being family friendly enough. The show was based on a movie around a young teen who is struggling with their sexuality and fears that he will prematurely be outed by a fellow classmate. A source told Variety, quote, Disney felt many issues on the show, including alcohol use and sexual exploration, would not fit in with the family friendly content on Disney Plus and it will be moved to Hulu under the name Love Victor. The film's director, Greg Berlanti, said the show did showcase drinking, but incredibly limited themes of sexuality. And this is not the first LGBTQ plus to get asked by Disney, potentially showing some bias from the network for these types of projects. And at number eight, Jake Paul. Jake Paul leveraged his Vine fame to score the role of Dirk on the Disney Channel show, Bizarre Fark. But he was cut from the show shortly after his YouTube vlog started to gain too much attention for Disney to handle. Jake talked about his negative experience with Disney on the Impulsive podcast and revealed the real reason behind his exit. Apparently, a lot of it had to do with money. Paul said, quote, I'm sitting there on Disney Channel literally making crumbs compared to what I'm making doing my YouTube channel. At the time Jake was asked, Jake actually said that he was fired because of his online stunts. So either Jake isn't being truthful here or there were a few different reasons that both parties decided to end the partnership. Let me know below what you think of that one. And at number seven, Stephanie Scott. Stephanie Scott starred in the Disney show Ant Farm. However, she told BuzzFeed back in 2015 that the role forced her to quote, sugarcoat everything all the time. Saying in the interview, quote, that's one of the hardest things, not being able to express myself in a certain way or being stuck having to promote something or say something that you don't believe in. Going on to say that hiding her real feelings and emotions became hard for her and maintaining an image of being perfect and pure not only hurt her career, but also the way she felt about her Disney character. In at number six, Terrence Howard. Terrence Howard is another former Disney star that left because of money. Clearly Disney is pretty cheap. <laughs> So Terrence Howard was actually the person first cast as War Machine in Iron Man, but he was replaced by Don Cheadle in Iron Man 2. The reason was money. Disney had originally offered him a reported $8 million for Iron Man 2 when he signed a three movie contract with the franchise. 
but when it actually was time to film, he only was set to receive $1 million. Howard obviously was not okay with that and he was apparently fired and replaced with Cheadle. Halfway number five, Chloe Grace Moretz. Chloe Grace Moretz was actually kicked out of a movie to make room for a bigger star. The 2008 Disney movie Bolt starred huge stars like John Travolta and Miley Cyrus. But that wasn't the original plan. Moretz actually was cast and filmed the entire movie as Penny, aka Miley Cyrus's role, but before it hit theaters, she was replaced with Miley Cyrus for that lead role. And even though I assume she was still paid for her work, it's obviously really heartbreaking to be replaced for basically no reason, just because someone is a bigger star. In at number four, Lelaine Vergara Perez. Lelaine played Lizzie's BFF Miranda in the hit show Lizzie McGuire, but she revealed years later that she was forced to look as white as possible in the show. She revealed this in an Instagram photo she posted a few years ago. The now deleted picture was captioned with quote, most of my life growing up, I was forced to look as white as possible. These days I struggle to find photos where I look as ethnic as possible, like in this photo, the most East Asian I've ever looked. In order to see for most people, you have to zoom in on the face. One of her Lizzie McGuire co-stars, Clayton Snyder, commented on the photo, quote, you were the first person to open my eyes to the role of race in acting. When asked why you didn't use your last name, said it was too Hispanic, made me sad. And this isn't the first time Disney has been called out for whitewashing in the past, but thankfully they are making progress now. And in number three, Riaz Mir. BAFTA nominated director Riaz Mir spoke against Disney after Disney admitted to using makeup to darken the skin tones of many white actors in the live action remake of Aladdin. According to a British newspaper, quote, the company says it resorted to darkening white people for roles requiring skills that cannot be readily found in the Asian community. A stand in for the movie said, quote, on one set, two palace guards came in and I recognized one as a Caucasian actor, but he was now a darkly tanned Arab. BAFTA nominated TV director Riaz Mir called Disney's decision, quote, an insult to the whole industry, adding that the talent exists and they should have tried harder to meet the needs of the film. In a number two, Gina Carano. Mandalorian actress Gina Carano was recently fired from the Disney franchise after she made some controversial comments on social media. And her firing has some fans upset, saying that they will be canceling their Disney Plus subscriptions because of it. The firing came after Carano shared a photo to social media comparing being a Republican today to being Jewish during the Second World War. After the post went viral, hashtag fire Gina Carano began trending and she was abruptly fired from the Star Wars franchise as well as being dropped by her agency UTA. And since this was not her first controversial post, one source told The Hollywood Reporter that quote, they've been looking for a reason to fire her for two months and today was the final straw. But in wake of the decision, some feel this is a silencing of conservative voices and shows how left-leaning Hollywood and Disney has become. However, this one is definitely open to interpretation. In at number one, John Boyega. John Boyega made history when he was cast as a stormtrooper in The Force Awakens, but he also became a target of critics angry the role went to a black man. Many years later, he decided to speak out against Disney and expose that he was pushed aside in the films. In an interview with GQ UK, he said about Disney, quote, what I would say to Disney is to not bring on a black character, market them to be much more important in the franchise than they are, and then have them pushed to the side. And by that, he was referencing how his character Finn played an important role in the first film, but was slowly morphed into somewhat of a background character in the following movies. He added that this was not a new thing and he was not the only person of color that worked in the franchise that had this happen to them. Starting us off at number 10 is Zac Efron. Fans were not happy when he did not show up to the High School Musical reunion and many people wondered why. It appeared that we were not all in this together after all because he was the only one who did not show up. He says he was filming Dirty Grandpa at the time and couldn't make it, but some of his comments have made fans believe differently. Zac admitted he can't celebrate High School Musical because it's not real. He said, you can't enjoy or celebrate it. It's not a real thing. The face on the lunchbox and you can't share that with your friends. He revealed a lot about his experience with the movie throughout the years and also revealed they removed his recorded voice tracks from the final cut of the movie without even telling him. They replaced his voice with another singer, Drew Seeley, but Zach fought for his voice to be left in in the sequel. He said he had to put his foot down and fight to get his real voice in the movie which is actually really awkward if you ask me. Like what an awkward position to be in as a teen when you were hired for that role, which required singing. Up next, number nine is Nick Jonas. He is another Disney OG who has had some things to say about his years spent working with Disney. 
He has said some positive things, admitting that he has good memories and that it felt like he was going to summer camp sometimes. But with that, he also said there was a lot of drama because people started dating and then throughout the years, they would just go and date other people on Disney. So it got very messy, but that is kind of expected. He also said that Disney makes you put on a persona and that creative control is taken away. He said the network has its faults and also said, I quote, Disney doesn't create role models, it creates characters. Which is a pretty bold statement because a lot of his fans idolize him for his characters on the TV shows and movies, but that is not really him. So their characters might be role models, but that's why fans get so shocked when like the star themselves does something that is so out of character compared to like what they're personal life is about, like Miley Cyrus. Although I think she went a little above and beyond. Swiping the number eight spot is Christina Aguilera. Yes, she was on Disney. How can we ever forget that she was one of the members of the Mickey Mouse Club alongside Britney Spears. But she was also one of the first people on Disney to let us know that there could be some drama with your co-stars because you're actually pitted against them oftentimes. Their feud has been the topic of conversation for years and turns out they were kind of in competition with each other throughout their career, but it all started when they were on Disney. As they started getting older and breaking into their own individual careers, the world seemed to have a problem with Christina and often compared her to Britney. She told Cosmo, I remember being hurt by these commercials on MTV pitting Britney as the good girl and me as the bad girl. It's like, if I'm going to be demure and innocent, that's okay. But if I'm going to just be myself, I'm troubled. It's difficult breaking out of that Disney persona for one thing, but doing that while you're being compared to your former co-star is even worse. And spot number seven is Ashley Tisdale. Speaking of co-star rivalry, I bet you thought everything was peaches and creams on the High School Musical cast. Two characters who seemed to be inseparable were the Evans twins, Ryan and Sharpay Evans. Their sibling duo is iconic in the Disney world, but Ashley let us know that her time on Disney wasn't always what it seemed to be. Apparently, she and Lucas Grabeel, who played her brother Ryan, got off on the wrong foot during the audition process and hated each other because of it. Years down the road, they made a YouTube video together where they did a cover to one of their high school musical songs, but they spoke about their off-screen drama first. She said, we were not close. We were not good friends. Let's just be honest. It's been 10 years. We can totally talk about this now. We hated each other. Like, I'm not kidding. <laughs> Lucas explained where the animosity came from and said that during their audition, she gave him unsolicited notes, which she did not ask for, and it rubbed him the wrong way. Basically, it was just a very sharp hey thing to do. Luckily, now that their time on Disney is well over, they are able to be friends. Up next, number six is Vanessa Hudgens. She's always been one to say that her Disney experience on High School Musical has always been a love-hate relationship. Dating her co-star Zac Efron was difficult because all the girl fans were always all over him and she admitted to getting jealous and insecure about it. Outside of her relationship though, she revealed it was difficult for her to break away from her role as Gabriella when trying to book work outside of Disney. She said she had to put in some serious effort to break the typecast and shed that Disney star stigma. During an interview, she said that Disney, I quote, closed people's minds up as to which characters I could portray. Luckily, she was able to make it happen and she's starred in a handful of movies since then and even Broadway shows. So she did something right. Halfway through our countdown at number five is Ross Lynch. You would know him if you watched the Disney show, Austin and Allie, where he took on one of the title characters, Austin. Being in the Disney spotlight throughout his teens, he revealed it was very difficult because people expect you to be the character that they see on TV. He admitted that he got lonely often and said that it was hard for people around him to accept the fact that he wasn't actually his character, Austin. He said, people start to think that because you come from Disney that you're a certain way. You're perceived to be such an angel and really you're just an actor that booked a job. Ross also said that people on the Disney team would also make it seem like they found him and raised him, but to him it was always just a job and he had a regular life outside of it or try to at least. Coming in hot at number four is Brenda Song. Most people who think of Brenda Song immediately think of her iconic Disney character, London Tipton from The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody. It's hard to forget a character like that in my opinion, but that was the problem for her, the typecast once you tried to break away from Disney. When asked if she regrets her time on Disney, she has always said no, but admitted that it was difficult growing up on TV and Disney at that. 
Similar to Vanessa Hudgens, when auditioning for other work outside of Disney, casting directors had a very hard time not seeing her as London Tipton. She struggled with being able to book roles and roles that she did book had very similar character traits to her character from The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody. I mean, honestly, I feel like I'm personally guilty of this because I cannot picture her as anyone else but London Tipton. And when I see her in other movies, I'm like, it's just weird. It's not London Tipton. Taking over our third spot is Zendaya. This Disney star continued to work on Disney even after taking on one of the lead roles in their TV series, Shake It Up. She starred alongside Bella Thorne and even after it ended, she continued to book some other roles on Disney like her show, Casey Undercover. But her experience with Disney wasn't always easy and even though she has had some positive things to say about the network, she also said her time on Shake It Up was very difficult at times. She admitted to J14 that during her time filming, she was forced to compete against her co-star, Bella Thorne, who was also her close friend. She said, we were kind of forced to compete against each other. It made the whole first season of the show just very awkward for us. Since then though, they have become good friends, but Zendaya admits it was never easy feeling like you're being pinned against your co-star, let alone someone who is also your good friend. That would freaking suck. Rolling in number two is Kelly Berglund. She starred on Disney show Lab Rats and admits that being on the Disney Channel is an opportunity of a lifetime, but that it does come with its struggles. She talked to La Palme Magazine and admitted that you sort of know what you're signing up for when you step into the Disney world, but that it doesn't make it any easier. She tried to warn other young stars about how hard it is to grow up in that Disney spotlight. She admitted that having your awkward teen years happen in front of the world can be a struggle. She said, being a teenager and growing up can already be tough enough as it is. Try having your awkward years put in front of a spotlight for the whole world to see. On top of that, she said she always felt like she was trying to meet other people's expectations and it made it hard for her to find who she really was at that time. I can't imagine having to live my awkward years in front of the world because they were bad. Very bad. Winning number one spot is Ali and AJ. Fans were pumped recently when they released an uncensored version of their song, Potential Breakup Song, which actually came out back in 2007. Their music career took off while they were under Disney Channel's music label, Hollywood Records, but then they took a massive break from music altogether and then later revealed why. Apparently it was their time under Disney that made them ultimately decide to walk away from their music. During an interview with Playboy magazine, AJ said, we just lost love a little bit, you know? We had experienced so much as kids and I kind of feel like we learned a lot about the industry that put a little bit of bad taste in our mouth. Whether it was a couple of people who we worked with or whether it was just trying to find the right inspiration or what have you. Fans were not satisfied with her short explanation and to this day, people still wonder what exactly happened that made them up and leave so abruptly it seemed. I'm thinking it was some of the people she worked with, but that's just me.